verse 1, certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent them on their way, and as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all the believers very glad. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders, to whom they reported everything that God had done through them. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and elders met to consider this very question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of them, the Gentiles, a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors was able or were able to bear. No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. This is the word of God. <clears throat> well, this morning uh, we're going to be uh, looking at Acts chapter 15 and we're going to be turning our minds and our hearts to hear what it is that God has to say about uh, Christian leadership and institutions. Are you excited? <laughs> We're going to have a, a, a chance to think a little bit, um, obviously not extensively, about how authority and power is to be apportioned and exercised, and importantly for us this morning, held accountable in the local church. Um, it is coincidental that Stephen is not here while I'm preaching this sermon. Uh, his uh, holiday was planned long before. But this does make up the, the fourth and the final part of our short series in the book of Acts. And where we've been looking at some of the earliest pictures of God's people, the church, and asking what it is that God wants us to learn, to perhaps implement, and to change as we encounter his word and the early church there. And so that's what we're going to be doing uh, this morning, so get excited. Now, uh, perhaps it's a mark of my age, and maybe you'll be able to uh, resonate with these stories if you are of a similar vintage to myself, but large parts of my childhood were spent growing up uh, in the, some nearby fields uh, to my home, where I would play um, almost every day pick-up soccer games. Um, on other days, uh, me and my friends would play roller hockey, in the quiet street behind our home. If you're wondering what roller hockey is, it's like ice hockey, but better. <laughs> now these games, these pickup soccer games, these roller hockey games, were really a staple of my childhood. Uh, the kids would slowly arrive, slowly fill in, eventually we'd have enough people, someone would bring a ball, maybe some goals, and then we would kick off and get playing. Saturday mornings, Sundays, the weekdays after school were filled with these uh, wonderful, delightful games. Unfortunately, um, as I've reflected back on it, uh, our matches didn't always end very amicably. Um, that is, they didn't always end well, or even with a clear winner being announced. In fact, our games often descended into squabbling, arguments, a bit of argy-bargy, some pushing, and sadly, sometimes someone picking up their ball or one of the hockey goals and running back to their house. And as I've thought back on it, I've wondered why this was, what, what happened to our games. Um, and I think it is that we, 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 lost, uh, our, we, we lost our way with bad calls, with, with arbitrary appeals, with questionable decisions, and um, with many the, the, the claim many of us are familiar with, you're just making up the rules as you go, right? 
And I think um, our games lacked, or what we really longed for, was some kind of authority. Uh, we needed some kind of referee, um, as we all know. A fixed set of rules to help us govern ourselves um, and to enjoy our game. Without realizing it at the time, we were all desperate for just a little bit more clarity around organization, authority, and rules, and indeed, um, power, if you wanted to call it that. We were looking for some kind of established procedure to help us navigate our disagreements about those games, and about, indeed, who had won um, and lost. And if you think about it, these rules, um, and this applies to those pickup games as much as it does to um, professional sports today, don't exist to minimize the enjoyment of them, but rather to protect those involved in the game. In fact, to enable the game to, to run its course and to make sure that there is no cheating, or in our case, to make sure that there were were not too many two-footed tackles and high hockey sticks to the face and shoulders. The rules existed to guarantee a fair outcome and the enjoyment of the game for everyone who was involved. I think this need, in fact, this longing that we had back then but perhaps couldn't articulate it, is true in every area and at every stage of our lives. Whether you're playing a pickup soccer game in the fields nearby your home, or whether you're operating in middle management, we need authoritative rules and leaders. We need appropriate expressions of power that are accountable themselves to some other authority and rule. We need leaders and authority that aren't self-seeking, but are in fact serving for the good of those involved in the game, or on the board, or in the church. We need leaders who aren't uh, aspiring for more power and to greater establish themselves, but rather to empower those around them and to enable them to function and better yet to flourish. We need power that is accountable and not simply ambitious for more power. Like, like me and my friends did in those streets of Durban, we all need good leadership. We need it. Now some of you this morning might, uh, might bristle a bit at that. It might make you a bit uncomfortable. Um, you might feel a little uneasy as you hear someone preaching about authority and about power and about exercising leadership. See, for despite living in a culture that if, if exclusive books is anything to go by is obsessed with leadership, we're quite suspicious of authority. We don't really like it when people exercise power. Now this might be in part because of the age we live in um, enshrines the autonomous self, uh, something Timothy Keller has referred to as the sovereign self. We all believe as individuals that you know, we, can, we can make a good enough go of ourselves and we don't need someone else or something else above us. But I think that the real hesitation around leadership and around authority is that most of us have seen it abused. And most of us have seen power entrusted to someone and then used in such a way that it either leveraged that person's position or ended up hurting someone who was beneath it. And so we are suspicious of power and authority. Some of you here this morning may yourselves be victims of abuse like that. It happens at most levels of life, hurt by those who were in fact empowered and entrusted to look after you, who ended up using that position to hurt you. From Hollywood to the government, from corporate organizations all the way down to the local church, most of us are uneasy around powerful people because we know how authority is so often misused and how people end up being abused 
We've come to the point where we almost expect leaders to abuse their power, whether that is selfishly or in nepotistic ways. We expect leaders to look after, first of all, themselves before those through whom they are meant to be looking after. And so institutions or trust about institutions is at an all-time low in our culture. And the church hasn't escaped this lack of trust, or rather this suspicion, largely because the church has not always done very well in this regard. There are countless stories of, of churches or councils and leaderships shielding abusive leaders. If not locally, most of us will know of pastors who fell from their positions of leadership, not because of some um, egregious moral failure, but simply because they grabbed at more and more power, prestige, and authority. Eventually, seeing the sheep, the, the flock, the, the God's people, as an obstacle to them growing in those positions, rather than the very purpose of those positions. And this, is, this has led to a whole host of new and really regrettable terms in the kind of church dictionary. You will know some of them. Heavy-handed shepherding, pastoral bullying, and spiritual abuse are to my, uh, as far as I can see, fairly new terms, and yet at the same time familiar to most of us here. And so leadership looks a little bit like it's in a bad place. If you take all of those influences, our cultural moment, our own experiences, um, the innumerable testimonies that we've heard, and, and simply the long history of people abusing power, perhaps we think that we'd be better off simply without it. Maybe we can just uh, get rid of it, you know, rather let no one have any authority. Rather try and simply push all the power down and spread it equally amongst everyone. And as, as nice as that sentiment is, I think we know that it's not really a possibility. I think we know that it doesn't work like that. We can't do away with leadership. I think in the church we can't especially do away with leadership because God tells us to elect and to hold to account leaders. Um, who will shepherd the flock. We can't do away with authority because we need it. Like those, like those games of soccer that I was playing, we needed someone actually to step in and to adjudicate, to help us manage each other and to know how it is to play and to enjoy our game. This is true of businesses and this is true of the church. There has to be power at various levels and in various ways and so the question is not, can we do away with it? I think the question for us this morning, and one of the questions that Acts 15 is putting forward and starting to answer, is how do we hold power accountable? What, what, what are the checks and balances for power? And so that we can ensure that it is exercised for the good of those who the person leads. The question this morning is, is we, without being able to do away with, with authority, with leadership, with institutions, as much as we might want to, the question is rather, how can we hold those in them accountable? What checks exist? I think the section of Acts, and in fact all of Acts chapter 15, deals with these questions, um, at least in principle, um, if not explicitly. And so we're going to look at them and see what it has to say about church leadership, institutional authority, and power. So why don't you open up Acts 15 if you've closed it, or just have it in front of you. We're going to look at it for a couple of minutes, and then very quickly I'm just going to draw out four principles about authority and leadership in the church for us this morning. So Acts chapter 15. Now we know, and you would have... Uh, would have heard in the sermons uh, leading up to this point, that as we come to Acts chapter 15, at the time of this controversy, uh, Gentiles, who are mentioned in verse 1, those are simply non-Jewish believers, Gentiles had been permitted into the church through faith 
and baptism. And they were fully fledged members with all the same privileges as anyone else in the church. But if you look at verse 1, we see that this was being challenged. We're told that some had come from Judea and were teaching that salvation, that is belonging or access and membership into the church. Well, it wasn't enough to simply put your faith in the Lord Jesus and to depend on him by grace. No, in order to, belong, to, to enter in and to belong, one had to be circumcised and subscribe to the customs of Moses. This is what the Pharisees say in verse 5, if you jump a few verses down, as they come to this council, which we get to in a second, reiterating this idea that there is something that has to be added to the grace of God before one is to be permitted into the people of God. And this is what the whole debate is about. Look at verse 2. As these people come from Judea, no small dissension or debate begins. Uh, Paul and Barnabas, who've been traveling through Asia Minor preaching this gospel of grace, are hearing something very different from another church leadership that has been preached here in Antioch, and they're saying, this is not the gospel that we preach. This is not what we believe. Indeed, this is not what Christ's work means. And this, uh, this dissension or this debate comes to a head, and the result, as we see from verses 3 to 5, is that Paul and Barnabas, along with some other leaders, and the guys from Judea, they all head up together from Antioch to Jerusalem for something that resembles a church council or assembly. You might call it a synod, you might call it a session, but it's a church meeting at a high level between leaders from various congregations. But look at verse 2 and look at verse 4, because this is becoming very important for us in a second. Barnabas and Paul, along with other leaders from Antioch and Judea, they go, we're told, to meet with the apostles and with the elders. What that little phrase, which actually appears I think four times in Acts chapter 15, tells us is that they don't simply go to Jerusalem to hear what one of the apostles has to say, some authoritative figure, head leader, such as Peter, but rather they go up as a collective to meet with a larger collective and to make a decision together. And that will become very important for us in a second. And that, uh, that plurality of leadership, you might call it, is, is not just there at, the, at, the, at Jerusalem. So look at verse 6. Again, we read the apostles and the elders meant to consider this question. But we're told as well that um, these are elders who are come from other churches too, or at least from the church at Antioch, to reach a decision together that will then be carried back to the church at Antioch. If you look just at, above chapter 15 and, and chapter 14, verse 23, we read another important detail for us, and it's that Paul and Barnabas, verse 23 of chapter 14, Paul and Barnabas appointed elders in the churches. And so not only at the, at the very top, as the apostles and the elders meet, but also at the level of local church, we're getting this picture that there is a collective or a plurality of people who are leading and making decisions for the good of those whom they shepherd and pastor. So when Paul and Barnabas travel, Barnabas travel to, to Jerusalem for this council, they go with elders from the church and meet with elders from the church. Um, and they make a decision, verse 22 of chapter 15, we're told, together, have a look at it, the apostles and the elders, and now a little phrase gets put in there, with the, together with the whole church, decided to choose some men and turn back to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They send a letter, we're told, in verse 25, to, to help them settle this matter that had arisen at the local church level. Now, we're not going to spend a lot of time in Acts 15, but I want, I want you to see that as we move from it into these principles about leadership, some very important things. The first one is that there are no unilateral decisions. There are no veto votes. 
There is no one person who stands above and makes the final call. That exists at the level of the Jerusalem church, the council, and it exists at the level of the local church in Antioch. They send their leaders and their leaders come back. Another important detail, um, which we'll get to, is that as Peter stands up, um, he reminds the council there, those who are saying that salvation um, and, and access into the people of God must come about through circumcision and through subscribing to these laws. He reminds them that no, the church is the work of God's grace. That is, the church was created by God and not by men. And so the church forever is governed by God and ultimately not by people, although they are entrusted to do that. The grace of the Lord is what undergirds the church and which runs the church. And that's why I think Peter in verse 15 to 17 of, of, of our chapter quotes from the Old Testament. That is, he brings to bear God's word on the situation. He doesn't simply have a good idea. He doesn't um, say, don't worry, I've got the solution. Rather, he says, this is what God has said. And that then becomes part of the solution to this dissent, uh, to this big debate. And so what is it that we can take out of this chapter in Acts? Um, what does it have to teach us about leadership, to come back to where we started, about authority, about how decisions are made, about how power is apportioned and how held accountable, especially in the church? I've got four principles, I've called them four principles for us this morning, and they're very short, and then we will take communion together. Uh, there we go. Okay, so the first one is, is that the, the title of the sermon, The Connected Church. As I was reading and preparing for this sermon, I learned a new word. Um, you always learn new words when you read theologians. Uh, this one is called connectionalism. I won't use it again because it's a bit of a mouthful. But um, at least since the Reformation, the church has always insisted on, on churches being connectional or connected. Now, one of my favorite theologians writes this, he says that individual congregations must recognize that they belong to a bigger and universal church. You may have noticed um, as we've started to reintroduce the creeds into our worship services that we confess or rather profess in the, in the Apostles' Creed, we believe in the Holy Catholic Church. This is not that we um, believe in the Roman Catholic Church, but rather that the church is a universal entity or body created by the grace of God that is scattered throughout the world, and we profess to belong to that. No individual congregation stands apart from that fellowship, but rather should seek to go deeper and deeper into it. See, this is an affirmation in the Apostles' Creed or um, I quote it for you, Gerald Bray, that churches and individual congregations should not stand alone. They should not stand in isolation. They should not become solely self-regulating entities. Because when problems arise, there is no, for lack of a better phrase, no court of appeal, no external authority. No one to hold the leadership there accountable. Churches shouldn't stand alone, and nor should individual congregations. As we see in Acts 15, the church at Antioch, as these leaders come, are able to appeal to the church at Jerusalem and to hold a council and together to settle this matter. Now, throughout Christian history, this connected church or connectional church has been expressed in denominations. And denominations aren't just groups of people who think similarly, although that's important. They are meant to be larger corporate church bodies that exist to hold individual count, uh, leaders and congregations accountable. And this is to protect those individual congregations. It's not arbitrary, but it's to guard against rogue leaders, whether they're individuals or collectives, or those who would split and dissent in the church. This denomination or this connected church exists to ensure orthodoxy, 
The ongoing commitment, as Peter reads from Amos in Acts 15, to what God has revealed, to God's truth, and that that continues to be the authority at a local church level and at a, at a denominational or connected church level. And so this is something that we must strive for here. To be a church who's connected to other churches. And this is something that we do indeed prize in our budding denomination of small churches around the country. To be connectional so that there is external accountability for leaders. The second principle linked with that is that Jesus is the only chief shepherd of the church. Jesus is the only chief shepherd of the church. Another way of stating that principle is that the church isn't and shouldn't be run by any individual. There should be no first among equals. Uh, it was George Orwell in his famous book, The Animal Farm, who pointed to the irony and the deep problems that exist when we start referring to people being more equal than other people. There should be no first among equals because there is no chief shepherd in the local church other than the Lord Jesus. That's one of Peter's points uh, later in the New Testament. And so what we encounter repeatedly, and I pointed out for you in Acts 15, not to mention later in Acts chapter 20 or earlier in Acts chapter 11, all the way through the end of the New Testament, is what we call a plurality in leadership. A plurality of leadership. That is, leadership in the local church should not be given to and entrusted to one person, but rather shared amongst a group of equals who hold one another accountable as they seek to shepherd the people. One uh, Christian pastor in the States, he put this very well um, to, 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 to help us frame what it is these elders or deacons do for us. Um, they, they aren't themselves incredibly special people, Rather, he says this, he says, human leadership in any church is simply qualified Christians trying to follow Jesus, and as they do that, to help other people do the same thing. The person on who the church should always and forever be fixated on is the Lord Jesus Christ. And as the profile of an individual in a church starts to overshadow him in how decisions are made in the priorities of the church, then we have wondered from what it is that we see in Acts chapter 15 here. So for us here this morning, sorry Dave, Dave Turner is not the head of the Union Congregational Church. Stephen, Trevor, Sean are not the heads of the Hope City Presbyterian Church. Rather, they are entrusted by Jesus to shepherd his people and to be accountable to him, to one another, and to that larger denomination that we saw in our first principle. Though certain individuals might make more public appearances, though you might get more WhatsApp messages from certain individuals in the church, men or leaders, no single individual should ever rule the church. Nor should a congregation ever be content with the label of, for example, Graham's Church. But you can chat to me afterwards if you want to know more about that. <laughs> <laughs> the second principle is a guard against individuals accruing too much authority and power, influence and sway within the local church. It is to protect congregations against utilitarian leaders. People who inevitably believe that they run the show, that their vision is bigger, better, more important, and must be executed. Leaders who start to make the church in their own image, as the church starts to become identified with some individual. Most of us are familiar with the old saying, um, which uh, quite tellingly was addressed to a bishop, uh, the saying that power tends to corrupt and absolute power tends to corrupt absolutely. And so in addition to our churches being connectional, 
accountable to outside churches and all the ships. We must be committed in the local church to a true plurality in leadership amongst elders, deacons, and leaders. No individual should be allowed to rise above the rest. No single pastor should rule the church. Thirdly, um, and I think this uh, perhaps might have been the first principle, but we'll put it here, we need clarity about church structures and governance. It's important. Some of you might be sitting there thinking, geez, you know, this is really boring. I hope you're not thinking that. It may be wrong. You know, this is unimportant. You know, that, so what? Others, you might be thinking, yeah, like, it's great. You can talk about systems, governance, until you're blue in the face. But some leader is always going to find a way to abuse it. But that feeling only goes to show that we need greater clarity around leadership and governance. Because systems can be abused, we need as much accountability and checks and balances to ensure that it isn't, and that those who are entrusted to lead are also held accountable. Church organization, clarity around structures is important, and I think the problem, or one of the big problems with it is, you know, apart from theological nerds and pastors, no one else really gives much thought or attention to it. But the time that you do start looking to it is when something goes wrong. When something happens in the local church. When a leader seems to be overstepping. Or when there is a report of of, of abuse or a scandal. Suddenly then we look to the governments and then we say, what can you do now? And if there is no clarity, then the answer is usually, well, nothing. And so we need clarity about authority, levels of power, and it's something that you as members in the local church should not be indifferent to. It's something that you should rather be actively invested in, committed to, because in fact, you yourselves as members of the local church are tasked with holding your leaders accountable. Writing about a large-scale spiritual abuse scandal in the church, um, one which many of you will know about, which came to head in 2014, one blogger said this. He said, how the church is structured is obviously not essential for salvation. We can all agree with that. Peter agrees with that in Acts 15. However, it is essential to help Christians walk lovingly and peaceably together as they seek to follow after Jesus as a corporate entity. These structures exist primarily to protect you as the members, not the leaders who have been entrusted and given authority over you. The two principles already considered, I believe, so that the churches must be connectional and the churches must be led by a plurality, are put in place for the good of you as the members of these churches. So that the church can become a place where people are cared for, shepherded, pastored, prayed with, prayed for, where the more organic aspects of the community can flourish and thrive without fear, where you know that those who are leading love you and care for you and want what's best for this church, for these people, for you as an individual. And so don't be indifferent to these structures. Getting clarity on them is crucial for us. And it's crucial because, as as one writer says, If we refuse uh, formal structures, informal ones will grow up in their place. So if we say the structures aren't important, we don't really care about it, let's just see what happens. Other informal structures start to grow up. The most common of these in many churches today is the pastor as the CEO, the council as his board. The congregants as, I don't know, his clients. Um, Maybe the worst expressions of these models that start to rise up is where the pastor is the dictator, the general ruling over his kingdom. These principles from Acts 15 may not excite you, but they exist to protect you, to promote transparency, to provide accountability for our leaders. 
and to create spaces for the church community to flourish. One last principle, which may come as a surprise on a, in a sermon about um, leadership, is this power in the church is not only top-down, but it's also bottom-up. Okay? Power in the church is not only top-down, it's also bottom-up. What do I mean by that? Well, I've said a few times and, um, that the members of the local church are to hold the, their leaders accountable. Um, in our meeting that we had in the Stevenson Hall a few weeks ago, we elected a new elder in our church. And even though he was put forward by the elders of the church, it was the members who made the decision by vote. And so it is the members of the church who have authority. In fact, you as members possess the authority to appoint leadership, which means you also possess the authority to hold it accountable. There are no leaders for life in God's church. The authority given to leaders is only ever provisional for a period, though that may be for their lives, and is always accountable to the congregation, to the other elders, to the connectional community of churches to which we belong. And I say this, this last principle, as both an encouragement and an exhortation for you, and then we'll finish up. Firstly, it's an encouragement. It's an encouragement because belonging to a church and becoming members doesn't simply mean signing your lives off to whatever it is that the leader of that church decides to do. Meaning that you can either follow blindly or when things get too bad, you can jump ship. No. To become a member of the local church, and this is especially true here, I think, as we've held numerous members meetings it is, brings you into a community for that time being that you can hold those leaders accountable. And it's an encouragement for us because, at least at the moment, these congregations believe that those who they're entrusted to lead meet God's requirements, are suited to the task to faithfully and lovingly shepherd the flock, and have demonstrated their commitment to the gospel. They've demonstrated godly character and a desire to care for the sheep. So be encouraged and be involved. But this fourth principle, I think, also brings with it an exhortation, because not only is leadership top down, it's also bottom up. And though elders are appointed by members, leadership isn't limited in the church to those offices or functions. Because leadership is bottom up, churches are healthiest, churches thrive and flourish when all the members are actively involved in the life of the church, in the lives of one another, exercising what Jesus seems to describe in Matthew 18 as small leadership expressions to exhort one another, to encourage one another, to hold one another accountable as we follow after Jesus together, to teach to correct. This is not only the responsibility of the leaders, although it is the specific thing to which they are appointed to. It is something that all of God's people are called to do. And so, as you think about leadership, I encourage you to reflect on all these principles. One of the questions that does arise for us is, is how are we actively participating in this community, in the lives of these people? holding them accountable as we hold, as well, our leaders accountable. So there you have them, four principles for Christian leadership. Now, before we get to communion, I need to say one last thing, and it comes in Acts 15, so you can have a look at it again. Sorry, I realize that it's hot. Um, Acts 15, verse 10. At this, as this uh, debate starts to kick off, um, at the church council in Jerusalem, Peter stands up and he says this. He says, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles the yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? No. We believe that it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as they are. As we go to communion now, it's worth us remembering this, 
that the church belongs to God. And the church is created by the grace that we experience in the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore it is that grace that must undergird and direct the church and all its members, including its leaders, at every single point. You can have perfect structures and still have leaders take advantage of them. And in fact, we all know that even the perfect structure can still be abused because well, the church is made up of sinful, fallible, insecure, and selfish people. And I'm only talking about myself when I use that list there. The church is not perfect. The church constantly, <clears throat> Sunday by Sunday, comes to the table to be reminded of where it is that we trace our existence to no man but to the work of God. And as we do that, we trust in him, as Peter says in verse 9, through faith in him and his grace. So this is faith that, faith that directs, governs, and will ultimately be the difference between the church succeeding or failing. Let's pray. Father, before all of those uh, principles and as uh, we seek to implement and perhaps exercise them here as members and those who belong to this local church, show us what Peter reminds us of in verses 10 to 11, your grace, the grace that sets no barriers, no obstacles, free grace, as Dave reminded us right at the start, free grace that costs you so much and yet for us simply to come by faith and to believe. And Lord, as we take hold of that grace, as we remember it now, won't you use it to turn us outwards, firstly to one another in this church, to our leaders and then to the world, that we might become those who embody that grace, who speak it, who preach it, um, and who depend on it. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>